All right, let's believe God for an amazing word that he wants to download today. So spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. God, would you unstop ears? Would you settle minds that are distracted, Lord? I know we're moms. We're thinking about a hundred things. We came in here thinking about a hundred things. We maybe have a crying baby in the other room. God, spirit of peace, would you just fall in this room? Would you just settle these sweet mamas? Would you help them to just have ears to hear and eyes to see, God? Would your, your revelation word come through me, God? I am not, I am literally your mouthpiece today, as I told you that this morning. I'm only your mouth, God. Would you flow through me? Would you speak through me? Would every word that comes out of my mouth fall on fresh soil? And may only what you need your moms. You have a tailor-fitted message for each one of these moms. So God, out of this word, may everything and only the things that need to stick on these mamas' hearts and minds, would that be the, the case in Jesus' name? Only hear spirit from you. God, give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you. As I was walking on this campus this morning, God, I just was, I was, I was telling you, Jesus, I expect you. I expect you. I expect you to show up. So God, raise our faith to come in this room, this sacred space, and to open up the word of God, which is living, Hebrews 4.12 says, and active And God, we're going to come in here and not expect you to show up? No. God, we expect you to move. We expect the power of God to fall. However you want to fall. But God, I expect you. I believe your word says that. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. So Jesus, you are walking these pews, Jesus, so we can feel you. We can sense you. And I pray, God, that every one of these moms would just feel the breath of heaven somewhere on their body, on their, just in their mind, the breath of heaven, because you are here. So why would we not expect to sense you? You're here. Let your word, as I sung out this morning, let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. Because we are here for you, Jesus. I need to hear from you. We need to hear from you. So we expect you, Holy Spirit. Breathe in and through these pews. In Jesus' name, raise our level of expectation and raise our faith to believe that you will meet with us in the next hour and a half. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Woo! Ready, ready, ready. It's been about three weeks. I'm ready. All right. So here we go. Week five. We're starting this two weeks on our kids, how we bestow, how we give into our kids. And let me tell you something. This was hard for me. Trying to think about, okay, what it is that our children most need from us. Like, how do you, how do you like, narrow that down? So this was really hard for me. But today, I, th- I think God's like, you're going to need all the usages. I think I, in the first couple weeks, I gave you all the usages of this word bestow. Some of the usages are labor, lead, reward, guide. Like, we're going to, like, encompass all of those in this, in, in this week. This week is so important to me as I was putting this teaching together. It's so important to me because this encompasses my heartbeat. Four moms with swords. Like I am so, you guys know, I have so much passion to give to our kids, to give to my kids, for you to give to your kids. It just, it's the greatest privilege of my life. I mean, the greatest, I've told y'all, I have been on some amazing stages. I have led worship amongst some amazing people. I have sat under some amazing teaching. I have ridden the bus with some amazing Christian worship leaders. But y'all, the greatest privilege of my life is that my kids would know and follow and expect to see Jesus in their life. It's it. That's all. That's it. And so that passion is for you, which encompasses why Moms with Swords exist. It's the greatest privilege we have, y'all. It is the greatest privilege you have. 
to introduce your babies to the creator of the universe, you get to. You get to. So how do we give into our kids? The question that you ask, and I pray that if you've been at Moms with Swords for any length of time, I pray that you feel a little, little better equipped on this how. How do I give to my kids? I pray God has done a work through Moms with Swords in equipping you to know how to do that a little better. But today I've come up, I feel the Holy Spirit gave me three absolutes that we need to give our kids particularly when they're in our home, and I think everybody here has a kid in their home, particularly when they're in our homes. There's three things I feel the Holy Spirit has given us today, some absolutes that we've got to give. But before we jump into that, I have another amazing animal mama fact. And I was going to give Anne a a picture of this pretty creature, but I didn't because some of you people eat this creature, don't understand that. But It is the giant Pacific octopus mama, calamari. See, some of you are eating somebody's mama. (laughs) So this giant Pacific octopus, her mission is to have one successful brood in her lifetime, just one. She usually weighs only about 110 to 115 pounds, but she's highly intellectual. Her gestation period is only one month. And her eggs are the size of a rice grain compared to the kiwi bird. Remember the New Zealand kiwi bird that her egg is like double the size of her body. Bless her little heart, she's like a chicken and she has this huge egg. Well, the octopus is just the size of a rice grain. But usually she has about 18 to 74,000 eggs with an average of 50,000. So this mama, I don't know how long her labor is. None of us, she must have a really long labor. So she hangs her eggs in many strands. If you look her up on, um, if you just Google them, it's really cool. Like her, she hangs her eggs up in strands and um, in the den of her roof because she has this den in, in, the, in the ocean. And during the, those nine months after she's laid those eggs, she starves herself to death. Because she will not leave her eggs. She will not leave her eggs. Sometimes these mama octopus, will, they'll eat their own arms before they leave those eggs. And mama always, almost always, is too weak to defend herself after these eggs hatch. She more than often falls prey to predators. Talk about selfless giving That mama signifies what you and I would do for our kids, right? Just watch an episode of Little House on the Prairie. I just watched one the other day when Laura went up to the mountain to pray to get closer to God. And Pa was like, you know, just drudging through everything to go find Laura. And that's that's just what we do. And so the animal kingdom, like it's even in the animal kingdom. I just think it's so cool. There's just nothing we wouldn't do. For our babies. There's nothing. I think the hardest thing God calls us to do is to not do something for them when he tells us not to. Because there are some times when he's going to say, nah, let me fight for them in this. Because our, our just natural instinct is to just like take a bullet for them. So I think I've narrowed it down, y'all. I think. And again, these are just things that I feel the Holy Spirit has come up with with, to me. The Holy Spirit may tell you something different and praise God for that. I am not the end-all, be-all. Jesus is the end-all, be-all and his word and what he tells you. But I'm the one, got the microphone today, so I'm teaching. So this is what I feel like the Lord has told me. So I'm going to give them to you straight. The first one is time or our presence. The first thing I believe we've got to bestow to our children. The second one is, according to your personality, maybe a little harder, correction, developing them. And then the third one, which is something I'm truly living out of, and I believe is probably the most important, I don't know if I could even say it is, but y'all, I believe it to be 
just of such utmost importance in the day and age we're living in. I believe we've got to give our children our truths and our consistency in living those truths. So our time and our presence, our correction and our development, our truths and our consistency in living out these truths. Now before I jump into this message, I want to just, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me this week, this is one of those messages that's hard, y'all. I'm just going to tell you from, like, it's hard. It, it, it might step on some of your toes. You might leave here going, Ugh. So what I really want to, I want you to hear, there is such a difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction shows you the answer. The blood of Jesus washes away sin, and the blood of Jesus covers all of my inadequacies as a mom. While condemnation, it shows you the problem, and it shows you that you're part of that problem. John 3, 17, God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Y'all, conviction is hope. So I pray like I was writing this out. I pray that maybe there is one of these three areas that you're a little bit convicted of. Like, oh, I need to, I need to, I need to step up my game in that. But in no way, shape, or form should you feel condemnation. So right now, in the name of Jesus, devil, I'm binding you up. There is no voice of condemnation in this room. Only let the Spirit of God breathe holy conviction on us if in any of these areas we need, to, we need to grow up a little bit better. Okay? Condemnation, you're part of the problem. Conviction, my blood is enough and I'm sufficient for you in the raising of those kids. It's okay. So there we go. So time, your presence Man, this is so huge. Think of it this way. You get to, and if you've been around moms and sorts, I've been saying this for years, like you get to participate in the plan God has already laid out for your babies. Because they were born with a purpose and a plan. They were born. One of the greatest prayers I love to pray over my children is like the prayer that um, David said that I would have fulfilled the purposes of God for my generation. That's the last thing I pray over John William every night. God, that he would fulfill the purposes of God in his generation. Your babies have a purpose and a plan. And you, mom, this is why I think being a mom is the best job in the world you get the privilege to take part in helping that plan be executed. But in order, order to execute a plan, you got to be in their lives. You and your husband, that you need to be the biggest influences in your children's lives. The loudest voices. Yes, Praise God, the Lord's going to use supplemental voices and supplemental people and um, camps and schools and youth groups. Absolutely, praise God for the supplements. But the supplements are only helping what already is sourced in them. And you are the biggest source, the biggest influencer and the loudest voice. Jeremiah 29, 11, it's a letter, this, I love this because we talked about this in the first week because I felt like I, the Lord gave us a rhema word. I talked about that. Well, this Jeremiah 29, 11 that everybody has in their, you know, it's in every like Christian bookstore. It's on a poster, it's on a coffee mug, it's on a journal. This was a letter written to the exiled Israelites in Babylon. So everybody, you know, there's some really high religious people that say you take things out of context. Well, nobody can claim this for their own if, we can take, if, we're, if we're going to stand in that, in that seat. 
But if you and I believe that God's word is today the same as it was to the exiled Babylonians or Israelites, then I'm going to believe it's for me. And I can take that verse, plan it and claim it for my children. For I know the plans and thoughts that you have for Sydney, for John William, for Sophie Kate, says the Lord. Plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope so we can take that word and apply it as a rhema word for us today. God meant it or God, God wrote it to Jeremiah to give to the exiled Israelites in Babylon. But because God's word is the same yesterday, day, today, and forever, it's for me today. So that word, that, that word plans and thoughts, in, in the original Hebrew, because we're in the Old Testament, is a word I can't pronounce. But look what it means. Invented means purpose or plan. So God has an already intended plan. Already. You're pregnant right now? Man, God has got a plan and a purpose for that child. For your children yet to come, you young moms. God has a plan and a purpose. Rick Warren says this. Time is the most precious gift because you only have a set amount of it. Mom, this is so true across the board in life, but for mothers, it is so true. And I can, as I'm embarking on one of mine leaving my nest, like shooting her off, she's about to be six months away from college. Like, really? Like, it is the most precious gift because you only have a set amount of it. So we've got to be active in the time we have with our children. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16, one of my favorite verses in when I talk about the, the, the necessity of, of us taking, taking charge of the time we have with our kids. Ephesians 5, it says, look carefully how you walk, live purposefully and worthily, worthily. Oh, that's, oh, sorry, I'm read, I'll read this. Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days are filled with evil. Another, uh, another, the Amplified Classic says it this way, buying up each opportunity, buying up each opportunity. That time in the Greek, because now we've jumped to the New Testament, so that, that word time is keros. And it means fitting season, opportunity. It's derived from kara, means head, things coming to a head, a favorable moment man think of it in your mothering you have a fitting season an opportunity a favorable moment with your kids but your kids need you they need your time and they need your present your presence that making the most of every opportunity, making the most of the time in the Greek, it, it is in its original, it's take full advantage. Take full advantage of buying opportunity. I love, I love digging into the Word of God. Recognizing the future gain. Redeem. Man, have you ever thought of your children as future gains? Man, future gains. They are their generation. They, their generation is going to be better because God needed them in it. That's what you have in your home. Future gains. Not fussy toddlers or emotional teenagers. You are a future gain. You are a future gain. 
Oh, complaining child of mine. Oh, whining child of mine. You are a future gain. You have a season, mom. You have a season. And again, you, I'll use myself. See me as an example to you. I have one that's fixing to leave my home. And it was just yesterday that I was putting her in her smock dresses and she was hating them because she wanted to be in tennis shoes and shorts because she wanted to play with the boys. And now she's fixing to leave. Y'all, future gains. Take full advantage of the time, of the season you have. That's why I love your small groups, being some moms that have olders and some moms that have youngers, because we can encourage one another. Us older moms can tell you moms with the younger kids, like, hold on, I promise. It goes fast. That's good news. It goes fast. And it's the sad news. But you have future gain. Take advantage of the time. Don't wish it away. Bestow to your kids the gift of yourself. The gift of yourself. Back in the day when John William was in the throes of strep, I told y'all that story. I mean, God, I fully believe, has healed him. But we, were at, we had strep throat all the time. And I remember one time the nurse called me. And if you know me, which I think you, if you've been around me for any period of time, you kind of know that I'm very routine. Like, I, I like I, what I think is the plan. I want it to stay the plan. Like, I love my routine. I love, the, I love that's why my kids were on such a rigid schedule, because I just love predictability. I know. I love. I love, okay, it's, okay, it's two o'clock. You're not hungry, so you're tired. It's nap time, two to four. We go to sleep. So I just love the, the, I mean, I need to, I need you ones that aren't like that to help me because I'm a little bit rigid. I mean, I'm a little bit rigid and my kids are a little bit rigid. I mean, they couldn't sleep anywhere else but their beds because I was such a Nazi about like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. We're supposed to meet for lunch. I got to go get my baby in her crib. We're going to, that was just, I love it. So, but I, so, so don't interrupt my day. Like, that's what I'm telling you. If I've planned to meet you at Chick-fil-A, it's great. But don't call me on a Wednesday and say, hey, you want to meet from Chick-fil-A? Because I'm probably going to, I might tell you yes, and that's just pleasing you. And so then you can say, Joy, no, I know you would rather say no, so just say no. Be true. So anyway, I love, I love my routine. So I got a call from the nurse. John Williams' throat's hurting. He's got a little bit of a fever. I think he's got strep. I was so put off, so put off, because it had interrupted the plans for my day. So I begrudgingly went to school, picked him up, and I guess I didn't have a good attitude because, so we get to the doctor, and, and you know, I, I am all, also, I'm just, I just, I just tell y'all all my stuff up here. I'm also not very empathetic, like not, I'm not, I mean, my kids, if there's a boo-boo, they really need to go to somebody who's, oh, because I'm going to be like, you're fine, you suck it up, you're fine. Sorry, that's just, I'm giving y'all, I'm just being real. Um, so I was not probably very empathetic with John William. So the doctor comes out, he does have strep throat, you know, it's bad, he, you know. So we get in the car, and little John William, I, can't, I wish I could have remembered how old he was. He was probably seven or eight at this, at, at this time. But I do remember this, because he, from the back seat, says, Mom, I'm sorry I messed up your day. Yeah. Barbara Rainey from Focus on the Family says this. Is what I want to accomplish for myself today interrupting my few years with my kids? I'm just going to leave that up there. And I found that quote not too long after that whole incident. Talk about the conviction of the Holy Spirit that led me to see something in myself that I needed to see. Mom, I'm sorry I interrupted your day. Moms, we got to be fully present with our kids, even with it, when it interrupts our day. Even when we just want to sleep. Even when we just want them to stop worrying about what other people think about them. We need to be in the moment with them. 
Don't farm them out all the time. Be present with them. They need your presence. They need it. Secondly, this is the tough one. They're all tough. This is tough. It's, again, according to your personality, they need correction, y'all. And they need development. And again, you and I get to do that. So this is, is that me? It is? What is it? My hair? Is it just, I don't think anything's moved. Maybe it's just, okay. Sorry. Oh, I should have put my hair up. Um, okay, I'll tuck it behind my ear. No, it is me. Okay. This, moms, as you and I spend time with our kids, as we spend time with our kids, we will see. What is this? Should I just change? I'll just change the handheld. As you and I spend time with our kids, as we are in with them, we're going to see, if we want to see, the things in them that the Lord needs us to partner with to correct and shape and develop, if we're willing. I love how the Lord works because a few months ago, before I knew what I was teaching, because this is, I've, I've actually done something I've never done before. I've, the Holy Spirit's kind of had me waiting to write teachings. I've written a couple of them a while back, but this one in particular, I only wrote like two weeks ago. And a couple months ago, I, I don't know, the, the Holy Spirit, I don't know, I just started, when I was thinking about this message, I just, the Holy Spirit dropped kudzu into my, 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 my head. Kudzu. So I, did, I started on this study of kudzu. And again, Holy Spirit knew for today. So kudzu, it is a quiet killer. Overtaking and growing over anything in its path. Kudzu grows at a rate of one foot per day with mature vines as long as a hundred feet. Moms, God, Holy Spirit put, the, put, the, put it right in front of my face. Unchecked sin in us, and I don't even have time. That's a whole nother. I, I'm trying to get through these so you can get to your small groups. That's a whole nother lesson. Unchecked sin in us, okay, we know. But unchecked sin will be kudzu to your babies. Unchecked and unoverlooked sin. You know it in your own life. I mean, just like I was just admitting about myself, like I needed to see that about myself, that I was exasperated. My baby exasperated me because he had strep throat. I mean, really? You need to see your selfishness, Joy. You need to see it because it can be like a kudzu and it will overtake and eventually choke out any part of the word in you. Romans 6, 23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. A.W. Pink says this, sin is more than an act or a series of acts. It's a man's makeup. Is it Isaiah or Jeremiah that talk about the heart being so wicked, it's deceitful above all things? Y'all, that means our baby's hearts. That's just, it's just... Without Christ, that's who we are. Andrew Murray says this, One great power of sin is that it blinds men so that they don't recognize its true character. Or in our world, we just dismiss it as somebody else's issue, not ours. And C.S. Lewis says this, Every uncorrected error and unrepented sin is in its own right a fountain of fresh error and fresh sin flowing on to the end of time. Moms, we've got to see it so we can correct it. But listen, you've got to be willing to see it. You can ask me right now, what 
I believe the schemes the enemy has against my own kids, and I can tell you, all three of them, what at least one of them for each of my kids. And I think it's in part because I have prayed a very courageous and very brave prayer only because my mentor has encouraged me to do this since my kids were little. And I am going to offer you the same brave and courageous prayer. It's very brave now. It's very brave and it's very courageous. And it's not pretty at all times. But I believe it is, a, it is our path to victory ahead for our kids. I believe it gives you such an advantage over the schemes of the enemy. Because if you know it, you can correct it. When I see it pop up in one of my kids, the scheme for one of my kids, I see it. You know what I do? I, I, I intersect. I intersect because I know what it is. Here's that brave prayer. If you would so join me in praying this prayer. God, expose the sin in my camp. God, expose the sin in my camp, my house, my, my home. Expose it. And again, I could go on another teaching another day about this, because if we don't do it in here first, it's hard. To, you know, because let me tell you something. My kids' sin looks an awful bit like mine. The things they struggle with, man, it looks a lot like mine. So first, God, expose the sin in me. Like, let me see my stuff. Let me see it. There's a phenomenal story, and I don't, again, I don't have time to go into it in Joshua 7, but write it down. It so um, just illustrates this story, and it literally is God exposing the sin in the camp. It's an amazing il illustration of hidden sin, and y'all, how it literally holds back the presence and power of God. The hidden sin. In this man's tent, he buried some things that he wasn't supposed to take. And it literally, God said, I will not bless you until you expose and get rid of those things. Y'all, there's things that God wants to unleash in your home. But you got to get rid of the sin in the camp. You got to see it. We got to be willing to see it. Then we can correct it and develop them. I remember, listen, this is just small, small, but I, I remember, again, as I was writing this, I remember one time Sophie Kate was little, and she came downstairs and I asked her, I was like, Sophie Kate, so I had a checklist. You brush your teeth, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And something in my spirit, Holy Spirit, like not mommy gut, not, it, if you have Jesus, you house the Holy Spirit, which is your counselor, which is your guide, like that's who he is. That's what Jesus left us with. So something, I was like, uh, Holy Spirit in me was like, mm, she's lying. So I asked her again, did you brush your teeth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She left on the bus for school. I went right upstairs to her room, touched her toothbrush, totally dry. I checked it. But y'all, it, it seems small, right? But in that moment, I felt the Lord say, unchecked, hidden sin, like not you, saying that, your tooth, that you did brush your teeth when you didn't. If you don't check that joy, if you don't get to that joy, one day she's going to go and say, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't smoke that. No, I didn't, I didn't do that with that boy. But see, as a little girl... I was able to grab that, intercept that, and you know what? Make her write me an apology letter because that's exactly what I did. For lying. Because there was some, there was some like, don'ts do in my house. Disobedience, dishonesty, and disrespect. And they still are. I have been known to pop my 15-year-old in the mouth. Yes, I know. Right, write a letter. But she back talked me so much, I just, and she was like, ah! sorry. Um, 
But I just, disobedience, dishonesty, and disrespect, Uh -uh. uh-uh. And so Sophie had, you know, so we, again, and we're not going to stay here. This this gets happy in just a minute, I promise. But we don't want to talk about the S word, y'all. We don't want to talk about it. In our babies, oh, they don't do that. Y'all, lying about not brushing their teeth one day, if not checked, could lead to something bigger. We've got to see it. We've got to recognize the S word in our kids. Sin. And this is the beautiful part of recognizing in our kids. And this is what I always go to with my kids. And this is where I, this is the hope, okay? This is the hope for some of you who are like, oh, I don't want to see it. I don't want to, it's hard for me. I get that. But this is what I always camped out on. The sin, we just kind of, we got it, but we just, we, we got past it really quick because I wanted to get to this part. Sophie K, sin separates you from Jesus. It separates you from Jesus. Isaiah 59, 2. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he's turned away and will not listen anymore. Listen, we're not to keep the focus on the sin, but on the separation that it causes you. As you bring up the sin, guess what? Guess what I got to do? I got to walk Sophie Kate back to grace. Baby, it separated you for a moment. That lying, I know your hand hurts because I made you write a four-paragraph apology letter. That's the consequence of your sin, yes. But the bigger consequence is is it separated you from Jesus. So now let's ask Jesus to forgive us and walk you back to grace. And it's like you never sinned. I promise you that is the beauty. It's not the sin that you focus on. I'm telling you to be a sin sniffer in your house. Be a sin sniffer in your house. If you've got teenagers, be a sin sniffer in your house. But the beauty of the reason you are to be that is so you can walk them back to the grace that Jesus has for them because of this. I promise you some of the things in your toddlers that are so sweet right now, if you let them go unchecked and uncorrected, they will not be so sweet and so innocent in their teen years. We got to get to it now. We got to get to, we got to let God expose it. Let me see it, God. Y'all, just Friday night in my 11-year-old Prince who does no wrong. Actually, he does. Unfortunately, he needs another mama because I'm like, my kids are guilty until proven innocent. Anybody else? Like, I really, I, I know, I got, I'm like, you're, oh, no, you're guilty. So John William was at the fair the other night. And I, y'all pray this, Lord, expose it. And, and he's sixth grade now. And this is what I'm finding, you boy moms. I've had two girls go through sixth grade, nothing. No, I, middle school years, best years. Middle school years, best years. I promise. I promise. I promise. Walking with Jesus, holding his hand. They're hardest, but I promise they can be the best, most fruitful years. I'll say it that way, the most fruitful years. But sixth grade boy is, I'm seeing some stuff in John William. Like, he's kind of like not really talking a lot. And I'm used to girls, right? Like, my girls tell me everything, like, I wish you wouldn't tell me some of the things you tell me. I know some of you have that too. So John William, I'm just noticing I'm having to pull more things out of him, which I'm not used to, so I I need counseling for boy with boy moms. So um, but I'm still praying, like God, you know, so God has showed me that, like, like he's kind of starting to hide stuff, like not or just not tell you. So I'm I'm on top of that. So, devil, I'm I, I see it, I'm ahead of it. The other night I get a text from him, Mom. If something else about John William, he's a little bit afraid of roller coasters. And again, mommy's fear, I've kind of told him like rides at the fair are put together, you know. <laughs> I mean, yep, so I kind of have that on him. So therefore my already anxious, fear, the, my little boy that's a little bit nervous, um, anxiety is his thing. Mama saying that, I 
called fear on him. So he goes to the fair with his mama's voice of these rides are terrible. They're going to fall apart. You're going to die. So again, I got to see my own sin, right? So I get a text from John William. He's with two little, he plays football. He's with two other little football boys. Mom, and I'm just glad he, I'm just glad he texts. At the end of it, I'm like, thank you that he told me. They're calling me a whip and a sissy because I won't ride these rides. So immediately, my response back to him is like, who are you, John William? Who does God say you are? So I got to that, but then the next part of the text was, I just wrote him even though I didn't want to. And the Holy Spirit said, he can't say no in the face of pressure by his peers. So I thought, okay, thank you, Jesus. I'm on it. Because you see, his inability to say, no, I don't really feel comfortable. Because I, I, I did repent and tell him, I'm sorry, I, Mommy cast fear on you. I repented to him at, at, in text, but then I did it again when I got home. Like, buddy, if you don't want to ride a ride, it's fine. But don't allow fear to keep you from having fun. So, but when he said that, he didn't want to, he the whole, when I, what I just, I felt the Holy Spirit was going with this was he wasn't able to say no when he wanted to say no. So therefore, I, I, I saw myself projecting him like four years down the road in high school. And I went to that story of Luke Abadi. If you were here when Mary Abadi uh, spoke about her son Luke, the Harrison kid that didn't say no to his friends that wanted him to get in the car with them. And he should have said no because his mama was coming for him. And he ended up, they had a car wreck and he died. Like that's where, I mean, I went all the way there. I didn't go there necessarily in the moment with John Wayne, but I went there. Because I, because I feel like the Lord wanted me to see, like, you've got to be able to say no, John William. Like, what made you not be able to say no? So my point is, the whole point of that conversation, amazing, amazing bedtime conversation with John William that night. So what happened was God exposed something in his heart, possibly a scheme that the devil has for John William, this scheme that, that the enemy has already kind of purposed because the Bible talks about there is a weapon that's formed, but it will not prosper because mama stepped in. Holy Spirit gave me the ability to see something Step in, apply the word of God and what God says to the situation, and guess what? We have victory over it. We have victory over it. But if we refuse to see it, y'all, we're going to be deceived. Be the weed eater to the kudzu in your kids' lives. Be the weed eater. Don't let that kudzu of sin overtake them. You see a little lie? Get to it. A wrong mindset, get to it. Ask God to give you the eyes to see it so you can partner with him in weeding it out and realizing, helping your kids realize the grace of God that awaits them on the other side of their sin. It's a beautiful thing, y'all. It's hard. And I, some of you, y'all, I'm a, my little Sophie Kate, like, she is never going to discipline her kids because she's too, that's her number one spiritual gift is empathy. Like, oh, like any, our niece or anybody comes over to our house. I mean, if they like cry for a second, she's like, oh, what's wrong? Come on, come on. I'm like, they're okay. You know, Sydney's just like her mom. Oh, she's fine. You get, you're getting spanking. Where's the spanking spoon? You know, like, so I'm like, Sophie Kate, mama's going to help you. Like, however your person that God has made you, I'm not, again, lean into the Holy Spirit on the way you should correct. He will guide you. You won't correct like me. It's fine. Some of you will. Andrea Christmas, can I get an amen? We are the same person. But so, it's okay. Whatever you need to do, correct. My point is, I want you to see it so God can expose it and you can partner with him in developing that for victory. And finally, huge, huge, huge. Our babies, I believe, 
need our spiritual consistency. They need to know what our truths are. And they need to see us living them out. I read this. This this is like gold to me. Like I have looked for this. Like I don't know how. I, see, this is where I'm not good. I don't know what to do with these nuggets that, that I find. I, I put them on paper, and then I try to keep up with them. That Sometimes I lose them. I, I had lost this, and I'm like, this. just this quote was just so, it's out of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3. It's a commentary on 2 Timothy 3, and it's called The Danger of Empty Religion. And I wrote it on this little note card, and praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit exposed it, and I found it. So now I'm like, what can I do with this? i got to get it so I'd never lose it. Again, so I guess I could take a picture of it, right? That's what I should do. But listen to this quote, y'all. This is a commentary out of the Word of God in 2 Timothy 3. This, This commentator wrote this. Satan works overtime to destroy Christian homes. Because that is where children should see the reality of Christ in the parents and in their relationships. And where they should come to know Christ and be trained in his ways, you get to. Nothing will sour kids on the faith more than seeing repeated hypocrisy in their Christian parents. Nothing will sour kids on the faith more than seeing repeated hypocrisy in their Christian parents. Now, this is where condemnation could rise up and know we silence it in the name of Jesus. Because, y'all, i got to do a better job at this. I subbed a senior Bible class last week. And, y'all, I sat in there and listened to seniors tell me that they don't believe anymore because of what they've seen at their school, what they've seen lived out in their homes. They don't believe anymore and these are kids at Christian school they have been soured they have been soured man Jesus would you illuminate to us the power we as moms walk in we walk in and our kids are watching y'all they are watching You don't know, but they are watching. Please know they are watching you. Yes, they they are watching a lot of other people, but most importantly in their lives, you, Mom, are what they are modeling themselves after. Good, bad, and ugly. I know you see it in your homes. Something comes out of your kid's mouth, and you're like, that's what I say. Something your kid does, you're like, that's what I do. So y'all, we have got to watch how we are walking. And I pray also that you believe it's possible. It is possible to have kids that are walking in righteousness, hungering and thirsting for it. It is possible. It's possible. It's possible. It's why Moms with Swords exist. Because I believe, if you believe that you have the power through the Holy Spirit, your homes will be filled with children that are on fire for Jesus. I just have the faith to believe His Word is true and His power and His presence lives in you. And it's just that changing that it is possible But you and I have got to know we've got some skin in the game. I've got to watch my time and what I'm doing with it. Our phone, how much am I on the phone? How much am, you know, Sophie Kate's trying to tell me something and where Sydney will just talk. She doesn't care if you're listening to her or not. She's just going to talk. Sophie Kate wants you to look at her and like, because she feels rejected if you don't. Like, okay, put it down. I've got to watch my time. What do they see me spending my time doing? When I'm stressed, where do I go? What do they see? I've got to be corrected by the word of God. I've got to sometimes say to my kids, I'm so sorry, John William. That's mommy. I was putting fear on you. I'm so sorry. 
I've got to let the Holy Spirit, his word, and other people that are in my race with me correct me. Because, y'all, I want my babies to see a mama that believes what she's teaching. And not only this is the problem, which is what I heard in this senior Bible class, it's not just that I believe it, that I live it out. They got to see you live it out. Look at this. Your influence. I just want you to see your influence. One of my favorite mommy scriptures is in Deuteronomy 11. Huge, huge, huge. Look at this. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, which is what the Jewish people used to wear. If you look it up, it's like a little box with all the, the law of the, of, the, of the Jewish, the letter of the Jewish law was in these little frontlets. Look at where it starts. And do you have any more after this? No, okay. Um, Cindy, will you grab my Bible out of my uh, silver bag right there. I got to read the rest of this. I need you to see this starts off with you shall. Yes, you shall. Who? You. Who? You. You shall. Okay. So you shall do this. So then look at where it keeps going. I'm going to read it to you. 11, 11, okay. That's 18, right? Okay. And you shall teach them, verse 19, to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land which the Lord swore to your forefathers to give them. You I counted five yous in verses 18 through 28. Or I'm sorry, 18 through 19. There are, there are five yous. You. You. See, the Lord gave me this thought for this part of this message. So I've got a part in this. You've got a part in this. You shall teach them. You shall teach them. You, mom. You, mom. Your influence it matters. It's huge. You get to. You got to do it first. You got to go first. But I think this is what's happening. The Lord gave me this vision. I don't know. It was, it was really weird at the time, but of course he made it clear. You know how you've, you've seen um, girls, if you have girls or if you know of girls, you have girlfriends, your boy, boys have girlfriends. Maybe, hopefully you've not seen this. Or if you have, you need to tell them to depart from these kind of girls. But you've seen girls leave the house in one outfit. You know, they got the Bermuda shorts on and long t-shirt. But then they get to the football game. And listen, I was at a football game a couple weeks ago, and I some, saw some girls behind a shed. And I surely said, I know you didn't leave the house in that. I didn't say that, but I did think it. See, I wanted to say it. Spank me. Nope, don't. I just... So you, you know you've seen them, right? You've heard that. You, maybe you were that girl. I probably was that girl. Actually, I went my mom just let me wear whatever I wanted to wear. So I was showing my stomach in the house. So I just showed my stomach all the time. But you see, there's, there's kids that will wear one outfit, and then they change when they get somewhere else. And this is what the Holy Spirit showed me. That's what we as parents look like to our kids. See, on Sunday, we're nice and sweet. You guys get out of moms with swords. You have such patience. But by about 5 o'clock, <laughs> mama is, I mean, we done. Sundays we're raising our hands. We're, I am not mad at the people in front of me. But my choices and my decisions through the week look a whole lot different. What does that say to my kids, y'all? We cannot just talk it. We've got to live it out. They need to know what we believe. Yes. But they've got to see us living what we believe. However Holy Spirit tells you, 
live it. Huffington Post, which is a secular news media, secular. Now, this is a secular. So they, they pulled from secular news. They, so they pulled from secular world, okay? But listen to what they found out. 82% of children raised by parents who talked about faith at home attached a great importance to their beliefs. They were active in their congregations, wore them, were themselves religi religiously active as young adults. Compared to only 1% of the teens, 15 through 17, raised by parents who attached little importance to their religion or, were highly re or they were highly religious in their mid-20s. Now hear from a Christian, Eric. I love this. This is Ethics and Religious Liberty. I love going to this. These, they have wonderful articles, and I found this one. Research reveals that homes that foster a vibrant, lived-out faith tend to produce children who have and keep a vibrant, lived-out faith. According to Glenn Stanton, he's on Focus on the Family, his research shows that kids who are most likely to carry their faith into adulthood are those who embrace spiritual disciplines such as prayer, devotions, and church attendance in their younger years. Lived out faith. Lived out faith. Not just talked about faith. I've told you guys before, what do you introduce to your kids the first time you introduce them to foods? Bananas? No. Spinach? Carrots? Sweet potatoes? Why do you do that? Because you know if you give them that sweet stuff, that's all they're going to crave. Moms, your children, and let me tell you, I've seen it ring true in my own home. Your children will crave the culture you create in your home. If they see you craving the Bible and what Jesus says, guess what? I promise you, not always and however God, they all have a, they all, God's got a direction for them all. But I promise you, it's a lot easier. They will more than likely crave it. They see you craving community and church I promise you, research tells us they're going to crave it. We got to live it out, y'all. We got to give them a faith. And we got to live out that faith. Time, correction, and consistency. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard in ourselves. But with God, all things are possible. And he in our weakness, if you feel really weak in one of those areas, I find myself weak in all of those areas a little bit, but one of them I'm really, really weak in. But you know what the Bible says about that? In my weakness, he's made strong. So if you feel really weak, if you've heard this message and you're like, ah, I'm just really lacking in, in my time with my kids. I'm guilty of not spending. I want to farm them out. That's the, that's the society we live in, y'all. Farmed out. And listen, I stand up here a little guilty because I don't do a house full of boys well. So, John William, you want to go over to somebody else's house? Okay, go, go. I'm going to farm you out. Girls, I've done. But a house full of stinky, rowdy, sweaty boys, I don't do well. So Holy Spirit has corrected me on that. Joy, you're farming him out a little bit too much. Get him here. Get him here. So God, I'm weak. I'm weak. When they come in walking in their shoes up on my carpet and want to bring Fanta into my carpet and want to wrestle and break a ball, I'm weak. I'm really weak. God says, Joy, I'll be strong in you. I'll help you. 
You have a hard time spanking your kids or putting your kids in time out and they really need it. Because let me tell you something, I've been around a lot of teenagers that needed it when they were little. Ask God to help you. God, it's hard. I mean, John William, I would go to spank him, y'all, after we had talked about it and I'd made him go think about it. I'm like, I got to do it, buddy. And he'd be covering Give me grace, give me grace, give me grace, give me grace. And I'm like, I will, but i got to give you a consequence first. If that's hard for you, it's okay. Guess what? In your weakness, God will make you strong. You are the authority in your home. God's given you authority over that child. You can tell them no. You can lay the gauntlet down and say, "Uh uh-uh. You can even give them a little one of those if you have to. Whatever you need to do, God will help you. So this is not a message of defeat. This is a message of hope. If you're weak in time, giving your kids time, God will give you strength to do it. If you're weak in correction, God will give you strength to do it. And if you're weak in these areas of living out your faith, guess what? God will help you do it. Today is a new day. You get a new start. Just do it. Even if you just start today. Let me end on some hope. I've been going through Psalm 119. The word of God is the greatest hope we have for our kids, y'all. And I've been having Sophie Kate go through Psalm 119. And I particularly have been having us, we've been doing it in the message. So I just want to read this block of, of verses And then we're going to pray and you're going to go to your small groups. God's word, man, y'all, it is our hope. You don't know how to do something, his word will tell you. Or a fellow sister will tell you. A good podcast can help you. There's so many ways you can get strength, but this should be your first line of defense. So, Let's read. I want to read over you Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16 in the Message Bible. Do we have that, Ann? How can a young person live a clean life? By carefully reading the map of your word. I'm single-minded in pursuit of you. Don't let me miss the road signs you've posted. I've banked your promises in the vault of my heart so I won't send myself bankrupt. Be blessed, God. Train me in your ways of wise living. I'll transfer to my lips all the counsel that comes from your mouth. I'll transfer to my lips, to my children's ears, all the counsel that comes from your mouth. It's just going to come from my mouth to their ears, Lord. Because I delight far more in what you tell me about living than in gathering a pile of riches. I ponder every morsel of wisdom from you. I attentively watch how you've done it. I relish everything you've told me of life. I won't forget a word of it. So Jesus, this, your word, is the way in which we find every area we lack. We find our strength We find what we need in your word. God, it is our counsel as we are counseling our children. God, may we receive your counsel so that we can therefore counsel our children. God, your word is our life source. God, your word is what we hang our hat of mommying on. God, you have a plan, a thought-out means, a purpose for each of our kids. But, God, we can't find out what that plan is if we don't know you, the creator of the plan. God, how can we partake in a plan that we don't get with the architect of the plan? So, Jesus, help me use my time more wisely. God, help me know how to correct my kids, particularly as they're older, what they need in this this season of correction. Help me, God, and help me live out my faith. Help me and Todd, God, to be consistent in believing what we're saying, not just saying and not believing it. God, help us to not have a different outfit on in front of our kids. God, and help these moms and every mom listening to know As Mallory said a couple weeks ago, it is not by might, 
It is not by power, but it is by the spirit of the living God. There is hope for us as moms. There is hope for our children. And there is hope for this world because our kids are going to be in it. And our kids are going to change the culture. Help us moms. We trust you, Jesus, and we trust your word to do what it only can do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.